Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of My Kitchen Table Talks, in which I invite people from the street to come in because they look cold and they need a cup of tea. So I've invited Nathan King in, um, and we both have a cup of tea or coffee. Welcome, Nathan. Hello, thank you. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know who Nathan is, you probably uh, many of the people in Salem probably know who you are, people in Detroit and, and, and the Midwest almost certainly probably know who you are. For those people are further afield, um, Nathan is an up-and-coming author, although not an up-and-coming spiritual practitioner. You've been around for a while. Nathan King is a mission-based witch, a cultist, psychic, and high priest, or Venus, of the Minoan Brotherhood. He spent a good deal of his magical life being trained in historic Salem, Massachusetts. He has been featured on Sci-Fi and the Travel Channel during his time in Witch City and has worked with several shops and events within his field. Nathan is also a practitioner of folkloric witchcraft and carries a deep passion for spiritual contact and pagan spirituality as a living art form. Nathan is an active ritualist and workshop lecturer at several events, and those who have been to Convocation this year, unfortunately this episode is, is going to be coming out just after that, but you probably met Nathan at Convocation um, uh, throughout the Midwest, as well as being a theater enthusiast and animal lover. So again, welcome, Nathan. Thank you so much. It's always, it's it's very surreal and crazy uh, when you hear somebody else giving your introduction, because it's like, oh yeah. I do a lot, and and you don't feel that every day, you know. So to so to have it reflected back to you, you're like, oh, all right. It gets old very quickly. Let me tell you, it gets old very quickly <laughs> because you know. I I remember when I had Matt Oren on, and we were ta talking about like what 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 bio we should go with first, and he was like, Ugh, just say something about me. I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, and that's so totally Matt. I mean, Matt, you know, he's he's totally just one of the most chillest witches that I know. <laughs> and, and so you can just let spirit take over and, and magic is made just by presence, you know. I, I, I totally felt that. I've only met him through like through through video here, but um I, I, I feel that. And it's funny because a lot of our colleagues get to that place too, where uh it, it just becomes such a natural part of our lives, you know, you know, our audience, it's like, oh, you know. Yeah, no, and I love that you bring that up because, I mean, it's something that we talk a lot about. I mean, even in my personal magical families, because when we all get together, even though it's far and few between, we work with these spirits in these, these continuums so frequently, like, we attract them naturally. So it's almost like you have one charging battery next to another very charged yeah. battery and it just hypes up everything. So when we do end up having these dinner parties, there is a lot of activity that happens and there is a lot of uh, significant stuff that spirit moves around, which is always interesting mm -hmm. when we just get together. No, oh, it totally is. I, I've experienced that myself. It's and it's fun, and it's fun in retrospect, kind of putting all the pieces together. It's like something big just happened. I have no fucking clue what it was, but and then months later, it's like, oh, right, absolutely, yeah. as is life, as is life, right, as is life. So Nathan, um, I mean, you it, the reason you're on here in the first place, you were on my list anyways, um, for my last season, but I just couldn't fit all the folkloric which is in. But the reason that you're on here is um you have a book coming out. So it's I mean, this is this is before it's coming out, but it's coming out very soon. Um, so tell us about the book. Yeah, well, the book is coming out in June. And mm. I mean, the, the it's so crazy because you spend so much time in the world of building that book. But really, you know, the thing about this book for me uh, is it's been the greatest offering uh, to my spirits and to my gods, but it's also been the greatest sort of uh, completion of my magical life. And I didn't realize that's mm. what it would turn into. You know, I never wanted to write a book. Um, that just wasn't what I thought was going to be a thing for me. I never considered myself a writer, um, but I love people and I love uh, magical interactions. So I love providing rituals for people. And I love those conversations that happen after ritual and the community aspects that happen in these spaces. And incidentally, through being in those spaces, that's how I met all the folks at Cross Crow Books. And this offer just magically kind of landed in my lap. Um and and so I asked, you know, a few people because being blessed in the community, we have lots of people who are authors. And I, mm -hmm. I asked, you know, well, where, 
where should I go with this? What should I do? And and right. probably the best advice that was given to me was, was by author Jack Chanick. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and he practices, you know, a very similar tradition, being Gardnerian. And um, he just said, have something specific to say when an author mm -hmm. writes something that's really good at something specific. So I really kind of sat with yes. what is the very specific thing that I want to say. And what stuck to me is just the mm -hmm. fact that witchcraft is very much... And, and magic, if you want to, if you want to even make it that much more broader, it's a very mm -hmm. embodied thing. Um, yes. When we look at uh, other forms of spirituality, especially for a lot of us coming out of like Judeo-Christian backgrounds, mm -hmm. it, there's this sense that magic and spirituality and the gods are very far away, and it's the sense of reaching out uh, and and pulling right, and in this mm -hmm. in this tension that happens between us and the other world, when in kind of contradiction to that when you look at folklore and when you look at other and older accounts mm -hmm. the other world is directly overlapping on okay. uh, on top of us all the time it's not out of reach and for witches in particular they, they're even closer to this they 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 have even more associations with this other world and so why is that and you get past these trial records and you realize oh no this is this is attributed to the witch's body this is attributed to the witch's blood this is attributed to the witch's skill now that's to segue into another thing something that caught my eye indefinitely was like this fact that witches are something in between being born and being made mm -hmm. uh and in my family even though i you know we would never say we were witches we had witchcraft and we had practices, but we called them very different things. We had um, our knack or our knacks, which is something that we're born with. And then we have our tricks and tricks are something, you know, that you picked up, that you taught yourself or that, you know, somebody would show you something. And these are, you know, simple things, everything from, you know, how to just tell if it's going to rain soon mm -hmm. to making sure that a neighbor isn't going to bother you really tactical stuff that just gets you through the day and so when i started to realize this is a common story and not only is this a common story that's throughout all these other witchcraft lineages and traditions but we can always trace it back to this idea of otherworldly visitors and mm -hmm. spirits having a very physical relationship Absolutely. with humans the the bells rang and I started going into the works of all of you know my influences going back to Gardner and Valiente going into Cochrane and Andrew Chumley and I really try to bring their voices back into the text to, to explain this very very large concept of what is the witch blood and what does it mean to be of the blood right I love it I love it I love it okay well a hundred different questions there I guess so. So uh, I've had several other guests on my show who've spoken about this piece particularly. I've had Theo, I've had Lee Morgan, um, quite a few others who have spoken about the innateness. Love them. I know. Oh, Lee Morgan was like, wow. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> well, such a sweetheart, too. I mean, let's yeah. be honest here, but that's just me fangirling. So I, 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 I think a lot of my listeners will get that piece. But for those who listen who are coming from more deity centric, um, can you speak about the separation, perhaps, or maybe the connections, however you see that, between that deity work and that innateness? Obviously, coming from the Minoan Brotherhood, there's certainly yeah. a lot of spirituality connected to acting and act and the, the sexual connection there, but not necessarily... Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not initiating the known brotherhood. My godfather was once, but not me. But um, can you speak to that then? Absolutely, and I love this question because um, even people who may not consider themselves uh, witches, but they still have some sort of, you know, devotional relationship with a pantheon, and they're practicing some form of polytheism, whatever. Um, I, I think even in that sense of there's the sense of calling out and there's the sense of making space every day to create that connection. When it becomes really physical and it, when it becomes really much part of that body is that first instinct of just wanting to do it. Like we get passionate mm -hmm. when we speak mm -hmm. about our gods and mm -hmm. that passion is something that is felt, I think, in every practitioner. I think it has to be in order to pull you, uh, pull you out of your bed in the middle of the night to do a ritual. Absolutely. And, and so it's palpable in the sense that it makes it makes you dream. It makes you want to get out and do these things. And it and it takes you to these places that you would not 
necessarily go, whether it be in the middle of, you know, the churchyard or, you know, in the middle of, of a field in, in the redwoods of Michigan. But that's another right. story altogether. <laughs> People ultimately, um, when they come to spirituality, when they come to religion, and I do think they're very, very connected. I don't think they have to be separate. And that's just my stance on things. I think mm. I think religion gets about a bit of a bad rap, the dirty R word. But um, what it does is it provides the sense of other people who have had similar experiences that can give you a similar verbiage and a framework. And there's comfort in that and there's safety in that. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's a certain way or there's an end all be all way to do that. And so when you can just have the physical instrument be your physical compass within mm -hmm. all these realms of spirituality, witchcraft and magic and metaphysics is the circle that naturally supports all of that to exist. Mm -hmm. And within a God, you know, influencing you in some way, that is, that is palpably felt. So if I hope that answers your question best it can. I think I think there is going to be feeling, um, and there is going to be that visceral sense of doing, even if it's very formal and very stylized ritual work. Mm. Um, it is all within the manner and the way that it is done. That doesn't, and I'm not saying that's mm. the intention. Mm -hmm. um, again, intention is an, is a word that get, getting thrown around a lot, and that's not yeah. a huge part of my practice. Yes. Um, but what is a part of my practice, and this actually comes a lot from my training as an actor, mm. finding the physical technicality of how I can influence my body, of how I can influence the environment around me to then yes. allow these natural things to have a place to, to exist. So I don't have to force myself to cry on stage when I can just move my stomach in a certain way because my stomach knows when it moves that way, it's going to trigger this body response and I can cry that way. So I'm not going into, you know, the shadow self and drawing on demons right. and needing a psychiatrist every time I do a performance. Right. Um, right. And so just by doing that extra work with the technicality, I have that much more of an extra relationship not with anything outside of myself, but with myself. Myself then becomes its own working instrument and a deity in its own right. We discover what I've coined mm. in the book, the sleeping God inside us all. Right. That answers the question. I appreciate you adding that extra bit. I, I was just going to jump in because I feel like a lot of people kind of 101 books i i'm not dumping on 101 books because i feel like i dump on them too much but there's entry points everywhere right but for, uh, for such a large paradigm and i think this is where folkloric witchcraft is really kind of disrupting that paradigm is the idea that um witchcraft is religious work and focused on on deity and that's not true I feel no. like we have more than enough people now writing on that innateness, right? And really getting back to that idea of, you know, being the second, uh, the seventh son of the seventh son or the seventh daughter of the seventh daughter, right? Right. And so, and, sorry, go on. <laughs> and that is, and that takes me into, you know, why I titled the book the way I did, because the emphasis is not on the witch blood. Every, you know, if witches are somewhere between bor being born and being made, then which blood is not what's important. The emphasis mm. is on the awakening. Can right. you awaken this innateness? Can you claim this innateness? Is this innateness a part of your lifestyle? Mm. That's the real trick. And that's the real challenge mm. that the spirits present for witches on a day to day. Um, and that's where the lines between witchcraft, being an art form, being a religion, being a lifestyle, being all these things, it's never going to have that definition um mm. we can never we can never be too sure about what this is but being uh being a uh all those things and containing mysteries it has to be those things for it to exist if that makes sense absolutely oh it makes it makes total sense to me and i think it makes sense to a lot of my listeners absolutely um, and for listeners who are yeah. newer to this and for listeners who are looking to engage in any way with this world and to come into contact with this world it, it is in the awakening of your curiosity and in your passions. Again, if you can find that piece of yourself that that makes your heart flutter and that makes you tick or a piece of artwork of the gods that, you know, your eyes get really big and you start to get inspired. There's something that's been 
created or connected something that exists inside you that has caused that physiological response to happen. Explore mm -hmm. that, investigate that, because I have found that those trails um, will connect you to this bigger picture of mm -hmm. all of these spirits that are assigned to you at birth mm -hmm. um, and, and may not come or may not be revealed to you until you are awakened to it. And most of the time, we have to bring ourselves to it. You know, we have to make the choice to cross over the circle's edge. I think that really touches on something that a lot of our colleagues have, have picked up on, especially the fact that the majority of them are all gay. I mean, let's be honest here, the, the number of folkloric witches who are gay and who are writing books and speak about that awakening is huge, right? I'm and curious. Sorry, go Oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, this is part of why I'm in the Minoan Brotherhood uh, and why I'm so passionate, you know, about the Minoan Brotherhood as a tradition, because it comes from a time in the 1970s New York City where that wasn't really even a thought ever in the general pagan world. If anything, you know, it was it only existed because of the exclusion and because of the homophobia that was existing in paganism at that time. And so the fact that it existed even then, and this, this continuum is, is happening now, not only does it exist, you know, within that predominantly, I think, within that folkloric screen, uh, stream, but we see it within people even practicing, you know, forms of traditional Wicca. And for me, as being a practitioner of forms of the Wicca, but also being a folkloric practitioner, what I love is seeing exactly where the two meet and how uh, they really are very much different takes on different history, and they both are very informed by one another, uh, even though I see them as separate entities and I work with them as separate aggregores because that is just how they are. Um, th they are they are naturally good bedfellows together. Products of history, right? Products of relationship, products of sort of, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What was I going to ask you? It was a piece right there that was really, really important. Um, but it was, yeah, it was along the lines of yeah. us, you know, the queer, queer gay men right. who mm -hmm. are practicing magic, who are coming back into line with, you know, the the mystery of not just what it means to be a witch, but the fact there is something about being queer or um and being of the other that mm -hmm. has tapped us into it in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at men who are historically witches, mm -hmm. there's there is that as well. There there's a there's a flamboyantness, or there's a comment comment upon their sexuality that's made, uh, and you see this, you know, throughout history. Um, one of my favorite sort of anthropology texts is, I believe it's called Blossom of the Bone, Blossom mm -hmm. of the Bone. I'll it's um I'll have to find it and put it in the group chat or comment down on it but really good text about analyzing about you know how these men who have had you know what society would deem you know different sort of lifestyles have always been connected with spirituality and have always been mystics um and it's just a really good sort of outlook in the sense that this has never gone away mm -hmm. and it's never going to go away no, no, there's, there's enough continuity, even amongst various different uh, groups, but that otherness uh, generates that. And I, 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 that's the interesting piece. That's why I, I, I'd be really curious to hear from you on this, that innateness, part of that is that social, uh, what do you call it, the... the, the... Outcasting. The outcasting, exactly. Sorry, I was trying. To, there was one right on the tip of my tongue. This is what happens when I'm like lack of coffee. It, um, it's, <laughs> no, it's it's outcasting if you're lucky, and at mm. worst, it's scapegoating. Exactly right. This is the thing. And both of those things are inherently dedicated to the witch gods. Yes. You know, I mean, who is but the most famous scapegoat of of all, but of Azazel. You know, and in in this tradition, you know, the tradition of you know the goat, the roaming goat horned god, mm -hmm. uh, which has its deep roots right with the rites of Yom Kippur, but also um, with the sense of of why goats are always going to be associated with the other, um, which is in order to have that wisdom, they need to have that outlook on life. They need to have that bird's eye view to see how society works and 
to know that they may not be part of it, but they can definitely dictate how it's going to go. Mm. And then just because of, you know, my Rolodex of things as it's turning, that makes me think of an Irish myth and an Irish lore. When you look at, you know, the the war goddesses, when you look at these tulatary war goddesses, I'm specifically thinking of the Morrigan. Right. But like their their role is stated as war goddess, but that's not typically what's actually going on. It's more as being moderators. Mm. Um, in the sense, you know, that they that they can fly above these battlefields and they can prophesize and actively speak what's happening, you know, almost like news anchors saying mm -hmm. what's going to happen and creating it by existing it with their language. Um, they can only do that if they are of the other, if they are removed from society, if they are feared and revered. Mm -hmm. And with queer culture and everything that's been happening with queer culture, I mean, look at, you know, uh drag queens are what coming to mind you know how like totally. growing up growing up you know it was kind of a thing but you know something that like was nothing like it was now and now they are the goddesses of, of our generation they are worshipped mm -hmm. they are celebrities and it's so just amazing and beautiful to see because you start to see again this this continuum of the the of how culture and society always reflects the magic of what's going on these things are naturally going to be elevated mm -hmm. but only because that otherness has been cherished absolutely because absolutely there has been there has been suffering to whatever so there can be wisdom that right that shall suffer yeah. to learn right um it's that piece I, about empowerment right it's about stepping into empowerment i think that's in truth circling back to uh the the question i had for you that 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 transition piece from oppressed to empowered even while still being oppressed right i know for me that turning point really was that turning point in spirituality like i was spiritual for teenagehood blah 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 but it took my mid-20s when i understood and i could step into that empowerment both in my sexuality but also in my my spirituality um that that then things started to work i'm curious for you with your book then how can your book help people get to that point is that the role of the book or is this more of a book of this is how i'm seeing it Great question, because I wrote the book with the intention that it could go both ways. Mm. I did not make one or other my focus. I wanted to I be able to give as many resources to the reader as possible so that if they really felt all these things and they needed more answers, I could give them a resource or an idea for a practice or some sort of you know recommended reading that would take them to, you know, exploring that further. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that is something that people are only going to be able to do for themselves. They're only going to be mm -hmm. able to have that discovery for themselves. Um, but I do give opportunities for practice. The way that the book is kind of set up, and this is, and you'll see kind of what I'm talking about, is you have part one, which is I lay out how I see it. I lay out all the folklore, all of the myth, my theories, um, the nitty gritty stuff in defining and explaining these concepts, which in writing, I didn't realize how difficult uh, it was <laughs> to do when you're talking about just, uh, um, yeah. you know, it's why the editing process is, is taking so long and has been taking so long. Um, but I'm very excited because I think it really shows um, the intensity of what we talk about and how mm. much effort needs to go into the importance of how we discuss these things. Um yeah, I lost my train that of thought. Sense. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That that definitely answered that that piece around that. You know, it it's something that I struggled with with my own book. Is is what is the intention and 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 you can't write a perfect book. Every, like a single book can't give you everything. Um, right. Right. As oh. as much as we would like to. Go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then there's part two, right? So yes. and so part two, you actually get practices, you get rituals, you mm -hmm. get spells, and you get things you can try out. Um a lot of the stuff though that that takes us into the internal body that gets us connect, you know, connected to this idea that we are terrestrial beings having the spiritual mm -hmm. experience that witchcraft is about finding the human experience in its totality, not in restriction, right. restraints, you know, you know, feast, love and pleasure are her rights. So 
that is what we will do. Mm -hmm. Um, I found that talking about ecstatic practice was going to be paramount because that for me was my way in to the other world and finding that this is a physical thing for me, finding, you know, finding the magical sweat, whether it be in working out in dancing or Mm -hmm. in ceremony or even in sex, you know, if that's what I'm doing and that's where I'm focusing that energy, it, it can have that effect because if you're able to train not just, you know, your body for magic, you can, you're, you're training your mind as well. All these things mm-hmm. are connected. They're going to fuel into each other. So finding the trance and finding your own methods mm-hmm. of trance and not necessarily that's meditation, huge. even though that's in there as well. Uh, but trance for me is the most immediate gateway. So I've laid out sort of my exploration and and the world of that. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going to operate so differently though. Um, this is the thing, right? This and, is and, that, and that's the exploration, you know? So if you can seek it, the seeking is going to take you to the mm-hmm. awakening. Ultimately, I always think that seekers are rewarded for their efforts. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the key to remember. It's in that it's in the process of seeking. That's the thing, right? It's the it's the journey that's uh, that's uh, that's going to not dictate where you end up, but certainly uh, the length of it versus the shortness of it. I'm yeah. curious for you then, as the writer. So, I mean, first book. Well, first of all, congratulations. I should have said that way way before, but congratulations on this. Um, I'm curious for readers before they've even had it in their hand, before it's even released. What has it been like for you to step into that role of facilitator? You talk about your own experiences in the book. What was that like to translate your experiences so that it would be viewable by other people? Yeah, great question. I mean, for me, it was finding about relaying relaying concepts, talking about stories, as if, you know, you could just like this, as if you could sit mm-hmm. at my dining room table with me and I could make you some sea or tea, burn some frankincense and us just laugh and, and talk about this crazy experience that I've had from the East Coast to the Midwest of witchcraft and spirits. Mm-hmm. And I would never have thought that this is where I would have ended up. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really- We never do, just, do we? It, it's just this this- uh, utterly humbling gratification mm-hmm. for where my my journey has taken me and trusting in that process as a writer that moment of reflection mm-hmm. when that hits you and and it hits you and for me it kind of hit me after every couple of chapters after i could read a couple of chapters and be like wow i'm not criticizing this you know this is there's something about like, this is okay. And having a security in what I've said, um, that really gave me a boost of self-esteem to my own practice. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, especially us as authors struggle with imposter syndrome. Totally. Mm -hmm. For us in magical spaces, we struggle with this idea of, am I being witch enough? You know, am I, is this what a witch would do? It's like, well, you are a witch. It doesn't matter. You have to remember, you know, it's, it's, we're not playing at being, which as we are. And so it's that, that idea of reclaiming, I don't know what philosopher it is. Uh, somebody contemporary, I don't know if it's Rudolf Steiner or if it's Alan Watts, but somebody talks about this idea of like the moment you question this fact that you are God and you're making it all just by questioning it, you haven't attained it yet. Mm-hmm. And that to me is the same sort of thing as, as far as magic and manifesting, mm-hmm. um, but it's not really about judging it for for me about the quality, but the fact that it's been done. Um, that to me is is what it is and is has been enough to been be some sort of sign of like, okay, this this was needed or this was called for in some way. Um, and hopefully, based off of how people receive the book, uh, i'm I'm really interested to see if it was needed or is needed. Um, and if it recalls, uh, us back to certain traditions or inspires us to take from certain uh, ideas that have been kind of lost, you know, 
in the 70s and 80s when you know witchcraft was radically transforming and and going through its it's what i call mm. the, the teenage years <laughs> oh absolutely no i i hear that and it's funny even i were, were talking about that that piece around how um how young a lot of these movements are, even though they're looking back at much older things, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump in with a more direct question then. Mainly, be, this isn't a gotcha, I swear, but I, I am curious because what you just said around that piece around, you know, even asking the question, um, I think a lot of I think a lot of writers, and I've heard this across the board, I certainly experienced this myself when writing my own, is that we can sometimes get lost in the place that we're at now that we don't even occur it, it, things don't even occur to us that they're necessary what was it like for you to consider the needs of others while writing this for yourself yeah. if that makes sense absolutely uh fear fear lots of fear mm -hmm. um a lot of anxiety in terms yeah. of just making sure obviously it was going to translate, but making sure that I was using language that was not just for the witches that I knew, but for the witches I was going to know, the witches that I want to know. Because let's face it, witchcraft has got this horrible history with being homophobic, um, pockets of witchcraft being borderline racist. Like, And, and again, these are some of the things that promoted me to write the book like this whole concept of witch blood there are there are, you know people will hear that and they will immediately think it's this some sort of elitist uh you know you're not one of us things mm -hmm. um, and on a very extreme level and probably at the most famous example we see this rise of northern practitioners you know who are using the runic symbols and doing all these things uh mm -hmm that are also associated with, you know, neo-Nazi ideology, uh, mm -hmm. which has been a fairly, you know, I would say we've been talking about that long enough in pagan spaces for me to call that out. And, and I do very much call that out directly for what it is in the book uh, because it's stupid and it's not mm -hmm. what these ideas are meant. And we have to remember, I think, especially as witches, because we're having mystical experiences with spirits, just like spirits are speaking to us in symbols and metaphors, so has our language, our spells, our traditions, Absolutely. and the way it communicates to us now. We are still just as much deciphering as our ancestors were. Um, and so I hate that, you know, it has to be said, but nobody is more spiritually prominent than another person based on their heritage or bloodline, whatever, because mm -hmm. I'm not talking about, you know, that kind of blood, even yes. though I am talking about blood. Yes. Yes. It's, it's uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I should hope that the majority of my listeners will understand that piece, but I'm glad that you underlined that for, uh, for those who may not quite understand yeah. that piece around mm -hmm. the, um, the blood. Then you talk a great deal about the ancestors in your book. Um, and obviously having written a whole book about ancestors myself, I know some of the common questions I get asked about that, particularly in the pagan community, because people have a lot of issue with that blood relationship. Oh, I'm pagan. I, I, they're not going to want to understand. How do ancestors fit into all of this? Apart from like the blood piece, how does it, how do they fit in? Well, um, they are the oh, big questions. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they are the blood. And so therefore, you, when you are engaging mm. in any of these otherworldly practices, you are working with your ancestors because you are mm. the sum of all their parts. Mm. You are you are them and they are just as much you uh, in that sense of you are the many and you are the one. Mm. And that in that way, they work through you through very, very uh, small things, regardless of your acknowledgement or not. And that's one of the things that kind of needs to be stated is, you know, you don't have to have this whole ancestor practice to be working with your ancestors. Mm -hmm. They inform the witch blood in a very specific way, because not only are they that first layer of, mm -hmm. of people that you are, they are, you know, they're, they are your tribe, they are where your trade is, they're your guild, but they're also the most connected in the terms of who's going to be speaking up for you to other spirits mm. and what kind of wisdoms and what kind of magics are they naturally have passed to you right. and on an ancestral um level 
there is also, I think, the sense of they transcend, you know, not just into our blood, who are who we're related to, but you know, where we live, um, and where we have lived and where we have always lived, you know. So there are people and spirits that I've worked with in Salem that I still have an active relationship with. And even though I'm not in Salem now, you know, it's like having a long distance relationship with a family member. Right. Because I lived where that person lived. It was like living with a roommate for a while, you know, so they became they became kin in that way. Um, in another sense, you know, there are artists and there are musicians and actors that have so informed and inspired my spiritual life. I have to acknowledge them in my ancestral practices because they have been so compelling in um, how I've been influenced. Mm. Um, and so I do write about, you know, sort of categorically all these different types of ancestors, mm -hmm. but they all connect at the end of the day. They all inform at the end of the day and they all provide more spiritual contact. And the more spiritual contacts I think a person has, the more protection you have and the more mm -hmm. influence you have that are going to work on your on your behalf and to your betterment. And that's one of the biggest things that I always get asked about ancestor work is, oh, I can't work, you know, with Uncle Jake because Uncle Jake was a raging, you know, asshole. It's like, well, okay. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you may not be able or, you know, want to work with Uncle Jake's, you know, spirit like that. But I guarantee that there is some spot or there's some level where that that might come into use or that right. may inform you to your benefit in some way regardless of mm. you need to have a relationship because how people are influenced and what people are discouraged from both of those things are just as important into how we end up where we're at on our trail. Um, and again, witchcraft, and I write this in the book, we work with paradox. We work with dialectics. It's how nature exists. So we have to consider all of those things. Um, when we look at the totality of these con these concepts, that was the biggest challenge in writing is making sure I'm including, you know, in right. that, those things and that consistency. But that's that's um, really what I felt kind of called to do and, and how I was going about it. I'm glad that the, I, the next question was what was the most challenging thing around writing this. I, I, I guess I, I, I'm glad that you added that piece again around that. Um, that multiplicity of ancestors. I feel like a lot of people get really stuck, especially in the in the individualistic West, on blood relationships, DNA relationships, and they don't consider the other various other forms of relationship. Um, and so, I, 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 I suppose, sorry, go on. Twenty five percent of my yeah. actual blood relations are the that's the percentage of my entire ancestral family. Twenty five percent, and mm -hmm. that's by my choice and by my working relations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I just want to say, you know, another world is possible uh, because these are your most immediate contacts. Um, they are right there all the time. And because you are just what I said, you are the sum of all their parts. You better believe that they have your best interests because you're that continuation. They're going to want you to succeed because your success in turn means that they live on in some way. And in, in, that could be very selfish or very loving, depending on the ancestor it's coming from. Well, and I think this is, a, I mean, this raises another very good point here. What is emerging for me, at least, and, you know, maybe I'm just joining the conversation, or there is a literal change happening, but it feels like a lot of us are, are now really looking at that those collectivist relationships, whether that be including more collectivist cultures in our practices like Catholicism, whether that be forming groups again from solitary work and, and, and whatnot. I'm curious for you in in kind of writing this book, is this geared towards the solitary practitioner? Is it geared towards groups? Is there is there is is that a false dichotomy that I'm creating? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I never, when I wrote this book, I wrote this for, for witches who had heard about the idea of witch blood, whether it be from a movie, um, whether it be, you know, I think there was like a music album that was like a heavy metal band was called Witch Blood for a while. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a word that gets tossed around and it sounds very mysterious and very mystical. Um, 
like recently there was a TV show you can watch on Hulu. It was called Mother Motherland Fort Salem. And it's about like a hmm. witch army that in like the United States, they uh it's very wild. And I was very invested into the series. And they talk a lot about, oh, she's of the blood, you know, and, and witches <laughs> have this extra set of vocal cords that allow them yeah. to produce magic. And I think, you know that informed me to be like this may be what some people actually think about when we're talking about witch blood they may think that we you know think we are of a different species altogether that we're right. not human they may think that we're in our secret circle sipping tea you know being like oh the mortals again you know and that's yeah. <laughs> not been my experience even though you know we do talk about the muggles um from time to time but uh yeah, I I wanted to find truth and I wanted to find a deeper spiritual exploration that people could actually use, whether than whether that be a cool story or whether that be, you know, a, a ritual practice. It was geared towards a full explanation of that concept. Wonderful. I'm uh, I, I have to be honest, I, I didn't have a chance to fully and I'm being honest for my my listeners more than you because I already told you, but I, I didn't get a chance to fully read through it. But I got through enough chunks and it feels again like, very much in line with what Lee is putting out, very much in line with what Theo is putting out, very much in line with that idea of innateness as opposed to just something that you do, because that's the other big stream of, of of witchcraft right now. Right. So Kind of re- kind of lo- zooming out a little bit. I'm I'm curious for you. How has your life changed since writing this? I mean, first time writer, not yeah. first time in the community. What's happened for you? Um, not much. I mean, <laughs> you know, it really hasn't changed at all in the slightest. In the sense that now I feel like when people want to ask me, you know, something specific mm. or something, or I can say, oh well, I wrote about that in the book. Here you go. You know, and or whatever. I I really didn't expect though to be this more well known, I guess you'd mm. say, or uh, to have more attention, I guess. Uh just from like and obviously I knew that was gonna happen from writing a book, but I'm such a naturally awkward person. Um and I like living in rural Michigan and I, you know, it's it's just I'm not sure how to interact with it. Um and I, I'm just kind of a let's grab a drink kind of guy. Um, so it's been interesting figuring out how just navigating public spaces and being recognized um, in pagan spaces. Uh, like I was in uh, Asheville, North Carolina at a completely unrelated witchcraft thing. And there were two people shopping and they recognized me from the Cross Crow, you know, book announcement. And I was in North Carolina. <laughs> you know so like instances like that really for me was spirit saying like be ready you're not going to be ready you know but this is part of what I think for me what it means to be a witch and to be a priest Mm -hmm. of my craft uh is this was a way that I could be in service Mm -hmm. um and provide service in a very heartfelt way and in a way that is subject to change because it is my first book right so the things that you know I thought about when I was writing this book were just what I said you know they were what I was thinking then so looking back you know even now there are certain things in in the book where if I hadn't have written those things down I probably wouldn't have been as open-minded about certain things absolutely but I've really found myself becoming much more accepting of other practices Mm-hmm. Um, and not being so, oh, so you're not an initiate of something. Right. <laughs> uh, because maybe they are. They probably are, uh, you know, yeah. but there are, there are certain nuances and there are certain things that I've just kind of picked up on from yeah. other authors and having other authors in my life and that you have to be unapologetically yourself. And that's very scary. But at the end of the day, it makes you a really decent human being. And I really, you know, I look to a lot of my other author friends as role models because I want to, you know, I want to be Jason Manke when I grow up. I want to be Thorn Mooney when I grow up. I want right. to be, I want to be those kind of witches. They stand for the same things that I stand for and they get me mm-hmm. excited about things that I want to get excited about. So if I can any way help them or play on their team, you know, with all these other authors with these messages of, mm-hmm what we're trying to bring to the world, 
I, let's go. You know, that's, yeah. that's more or less what I've learned, what I've discovered. Yeah. And it's taken a huge, you know, when you, when you say that, like this book is a time capsule and it's subject to change, yeah. the pressure's off of me, babe. Yeah. And that, <laughs> And that's and that's kind of nice too to to just admit that the fact of it all. That piece around it's a snapshot when when I started putting my podcast out and really connecting with other authors and and I kept hearing that same thing over and over again. I was like, yeah, okay. Now two years later, two and a half years later, almost three years later, I'm like, yeah, I totally get it. You know, and that 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 relieves the pressure. Because I think a lot of us feel the pressure, especially with our first books, of I need to make this perfect. I need to make this right. Versus right. this is just a part of our journey, right? Right. And I mean, when we look at, and, and I'll take this on the bigger thing, but every ritual Please. that I do, every spell that I do, every prayer that I do, and every piece of art that I create, let's put them all in the same category. Um, I don't think of those as much as like these huge projects, but like those are little diary entries those yeah. are little journal entries that I that I pop in and so in a way you know nobody can judge you for mm -hmm. what that is and how it looks nobody can cheat because it's just what you did mm -hmm. and and it's only through personal diaries and you know those sort of things that our stories are told as the individuals so yes. in a way there's that sense of execution through the artistry of being a witch that just by doing, I'm doing the work. So it is about taking, you know, just letting the gods take care of the quality of it, but knowing that I'm just going to keep doing it and that it's going to improve because I have the feeling behind it. And and I think that that feeling is critical. Yes. Um, I only do witchcraft if I'm feeling it. I, I, you know, in the sense that, yes, it's work, but I still have a passion for it. You know, I still think it's important. I still think it's part of my values and my ethics to do it. You know, you're not going to be enthusiastically feeling it and you're not mm. going to be happily feeling it. You know, sometimes it does feel like work when you just have to do something, um, but you still feel like you have to do it, right? So so you have to be good on your own personal word and and execute these sort of things that we do in our packs and our, totally. our agreements with spirits. For the benefit of our listeners, somebody who might be listening to this, really new to all of this, can you describe that feeling that you were just talking about? Yeah. Um, it's very similar to being in a close relationship with a friend and saying, okay, I'm going to pick you up at eight. And you feel really tired. You want to take a nap at eight o'clock rolls around. You would not leave your friend out there Right. stranded you know that would be rude that might really mess up your friendship that would really ruin your relationship so is that relationship worth enough to you do you have enough care or feeling with your spiritual relationship to then carry out what you said you were going to do right. um that's why you know that's why it's a craft you it's a time it gets better with improvement it's going to take work but you have to have that sort of zest uh and willingness behind it uh, for it to be effective, it has to mean mm -hmm. something to you. That's perfect. Thank you. I really appreciate I, I I know that feeling myself. And it's funny, like I, I keep saying this story, but it's that it was such a visceral thing for me. That that really underlining that that piece of responsibility, that feeling of responsibility was seeing a student who I could see in his eyes how much whatever I was saying to him was meaning to him. And at that moment, it was like that feeling of, fuck, you know, like, don't do that to me. But knowing that I was in that place, right, that feeling of responsibility and not just the, well, I can put it off. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's that, no, you have responsibility. The ball is only in your court right now. Right. And that, I mean, I encountered that in my work, you know, with running my, my Grove. I run, mm -hmm. I encounter that you know, increasingly more so in, in lecture spaces as, you mm -hmm. know, the topics of what I'm lecturing about become a little bit more um, poignant, I will say, or, you know, they're more of the times, right? So they get people talking. Yeah. Um, but that sense of responsibility, uh, 
when when I meet other witches, you know, it, it's almost that sense of, you know, well, yes, I do care a lot about this sort of thing. And how could you not? And, and every witch I've met has that sense of care um, and has that sense of diligence when, especially when it comes to other people, how we translate that to our spirits and to the divine is still a work in progress. And it's something that we're still figuring out ways to figure out. And ultimately, that's why I think there's value in covens because there's value in community. There's value in bouncing ideas on people. That is not to say, and that's the end all be all, because I think for solitary practitioners, there's just as much community into, you know, going to a pagan fest, meeting another witch at a bar, or just, you know, doing your own thing and meeting people who have like-minded ideas. Um these things exist and these things change, but ultimately that alchemy within you never stops. It's mm-hmm. it's always a process and it's always there. Um, as for, yeah, responsibility, man. That totally makes sense. Yeah, I, oh. it's, it's a huge thing. I know. <laughs> this is, this I know. Is, you know this, is, this is why we talk about sovereignty because ultimately, you know, we are we're sovereigns of ourselves first and foremost. Yes. I, in order for me to be truly uh, responsible and taking care of what I need to be, you know, I need to be stable in myself first and foremost. One of my favorite things to say, you know, especially, you know, if you're dealing, um, like for me, I deal with like really intense anxiety and I got to say, you know, if, if I'm unstable, my magic is going to be unstable. So sometimes there is that sense of just having to retreat. Um, and people are very, uh, respectful of that, you know, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, the more you do that, though, the better your work becomes, the easier work becomes. Um, everybody, you know, will find their role manageable if it is truly your role is what, I've, is always, what I've always kind of believed. Yeah. This is the thing I feel like. And this is one of the I would say I, I it's a criticism. It's a criticism of the whole magical approach to living, the paganism, all of this, right? Is that I would say that we have such an individualistic Protestant notion in all of these traditions, which says you have to be everything, you have to do everything you, in order to be the witch, the witch of so and so, the witch of blah blah blah, right? Right. And and that's I think that that's false. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to be a witch. Well, this is the thing, right? I, it's, thing. you know, it, it's that whole branding. And I, I realize we're both authors who publish works out there saying this, but like that idea that we have to be everything, that we have to do everything. You know, I had to get, I, I reached out to somebody who um, is a, a fellow author. I won't say who, privacy reasons, but um, they were geared to come on to the show. And then they emailed me and they said, you know what? I'm just enjoying not being an author anymore. I, I don't want to do this. I'm like, you know what? I totally get what you're saying. I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, no, I mean, because there are times, I mean, especially like for me, there were parts in the editing process where it's like, what do they want from me? <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and it's really, you know, it just, you look at your work and you're like, oh, okay, you know, and you figure yeah. it out and it's that much more better. Um, I find that in, even trying to figure out, you know, certain situations with my students. I mean, it's one thing to be an author and to have that responsibility with your words. It's a completely another thing to, for me to be a coven leader, because for me, and, you know, especially with my initiates, uh, I am then responsible, you know, for their spiritual contacts as well, and just their general well-being, you know. So there are times where my phone goes off at two in the morning and, we have to talk about something, you know, or I literally, you know, this, I think it was this past Christmas, I ended up going out into a clandestine location because somebody's Goetia ritual went a little, a little too scary for them. These are situations you find yourself in. It's wild. It's crazy, but you do it because you love it and you do it because you're called to do it. And I think that as long as that calling exists that love for me hasn't gone away right doesn't necessarily mean i like it all the time right there are times again it feels like work and i'm gritting my teeth and driving on the freeway to circle but um i still cherish every moment of it and i find that you know even if i approach a circle with resistance 
the moment I cross in that circle, I allow that ritual to take in. I leave that circle 10 times better than I entered it because I made the sacrifice of my time. And it was that much more important because I didn't really feel like it in that moment. And that is a true sacrifice. Like not just casually saying that word. That's a really intentional word. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So with that being said, then, silly question to ask after that. What are you working on next? <laughs> oh, great question. So I don't even know. I don't even know if I'm allowed to announce the next thing yet. But I know mm, we're on the side of caution, just to be on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will say though that I'm doing a lot of research right now. Um, that is very specific to my area of location. Um, so I'm looking okay. at a lot of Great Lakes folklore, a lot of Michigan practices, mm. a lot of Michigan-based spirits. Um, I'm really trying to hype up and build context with some tulatary spirits that we have in the Detroit area mm. that are very, very mischievous, to say the wonderful. least. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Yeah, so I would expect to see a lot more local-oriented, uh, magical-based stuff from me. Mm -hmm. um, but the next, really, like, the big sort of thing, the next project, like, the goals that I'm trying to set is I really want to start to... Uh, be coming out to more festivals and to be mm -hmm. meeting more people who have a festival or have a shop um, because I again my value is in community and in being able uh, to just build connections and if this book does that in some way then I would love to hear from those people and find those spaces and travel to those places um, because one of the most magical things that's happened since writing this book is just the the traveling i mean just you yeah. find yourself meeting people from all over um and that's a real gift because you just you know realize that it's a small world after all <laughs> and, oh the number of times i've mentioned somebody and it turns out that that person i'm speaking to already knows them from like 15 years ago 25 years ago whatever right it's a tiny tiny world it really yeah. is yeah and yeah. it and it reinstates my faith in the fact like, oh yeah, like witches are kind of this worldwide family. Like mm -hmm. there is this connection. We are that close um, yeah. and it's growing and it's yeah. fast and it just boggles me, you know, every time I really think about it. Uh, and I'm just so par uh, proud and uh, also nervous at times to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it speaks to um, and a, a good tie into the, the conversation here. You start out the book with um, talking about weird and fate and those interconnections, right? And that's something I've really seen myself. Like the number of authors who I discovered just through talking to them now, we used to chat 20 years ago on AOL way back in the day, and we didn't realize it. You know, the number of times those connections there, because many of us are on, of the same age generation-wise, is fascinating. And it's um, it's interesting how we come back, right? Well, here's a great example of just that, um, is, you know, my very first ever public ritual that I snuck out of the house, you know, to go to was um, this Peruvian fire ceremony that was done in this older couple's backyard in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. I mean, right. And, and I did this thing and I met these people. It was super cool. Well, of course, my parents found out and they <laughs> were course. mad and they, they picked me up, found my location, you know, and it was it was that and whatever. Fast forward to, you know, my post-Salem life, now living back in Michigan, two of those people that were at that ceremony that I probably said maybe a few things to are now part of my coven, you know, <laughs> and part of my general working spiritual life. And we have that closeness. It, it, you know, it's, it's just, yeah. Fate, I know. Well, I know. It, she has all these different names. She has all these different figures, but she ultimately, um, is I think the essence of truth and truth as I describe it in the book with a capital T in the sense that truth has to be ambiguous. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it is what it is. It's that sense of infinite, whatever it may be. Um, which is, I think when we tap into that, we really see that as the goddess figure. We see that as a very, you know, stately woman. Um, mm. 
and and I just vibe with that there is something on some level of truth to that you know that it, it is she who is all of the space between the spaces that holds the world together mm-hmm. and you know carries us from behind um one of the meditation practices that I like to use to kind of tap into this idea of finding my fate or finding the weird, however it is you conceptualize her, um, is you sit, you put your hand over your heart, um, and you just focus on the space behind you. Mm, each right. breath, with each breath, you're almost going to allow her to come closer and closer. So by the end of it, she's fully embracing you. So you feel the sense of liminality the space and the air and the molecules fully condensing and being just as present and just as spiritually alive as your body, because it is. Um, And that's a very Hecate oriented mystery and and kind of where I'm at right now in my life, you know, and you can, you can assign that to what you will, but true truth will always be the witch's work um, by surrendering to it you make that process of seeking it that much easier. But Mm -hmm. truly, you have to be able to receive people and you have to receive situations as they are and not as you want them to be. And our bias bias is going to get in the way. That's why we use these practices because these practices help eliminate some of that. So it's always going to be a balance of these two things working together, getting you on that journey. Totally makes sense. It reminds me of a conversation I was having, and I won't say with who because it was a private conversation, but we were talking about the people who they practice magic, but they don't believe in it. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. And then that idea of that stepping into that truth, a lot of times it's used as a way of deceiving themselves, right? And so, of course, it won't work, right? Yeah. Well, and this for me, you know, uh, when you live in a predominantly Christian background and you come out of those things, you know, people in witchcraft are so sick of hearing, you know, well, it wasn't God's will. Mm. You know, and they're so sick of hearing, well, it just wasn't meant to be. Well, well, I'm a witch and I willed it to be. So why the, you know, did it happen? You know, and here's the thing is we always at the end of the day have to, you know, look at the power that we're using, the power mm. that we're plugging into and understanding, you know, if capital T truth of our world is it is this very big interconnected thing. Mm -hmm. And of course this isn't going to happen. You know, there, there is this idea of we have to be willing, receptive and humble enough to allow our senses to tell us what's going on and not what we really, you know, want. Again, that goes back to that bias we have. I have found that for me as a witch, um, the moment that I try to stop believing in it, I will believe in it 10 times more because something will happen that'll take you right back into that wheel and keep it spinning. Um, And it, and it is cyclical. We, we, we are observing and plugging ourselves into these powers because these powers have different push and pulls at different times of year, you know, by observing these Sabbaths, fury nights, tides of power whatever you call them we we align we attune ourselves to something um that is very physical but that ebbs and it flows we and we are very cognizant of that and we have to be accepting of this thing that is going to ebb and flow again we work with paradox and dialectics we do absolutely final question then and i'm glad that you ended with that because that leads right into the final question so something that um, Devin Hunter was recently talking about in on his page and something I really thought about, and it's true, oftentimes when we step into writing something, oftentimes, at least I found this with myself, a lot of my friends did too, um, we have a crisis that is connected somehow to what we were writing about. And I'm curious for you, did you go through anything when writing this? And what? how has that changed your life? Absolutely. Um... Well, <laughs> in the sense that, well, let me back this up. So yeah. when I figured out what the witch blood meant to me, this was way before I wrote the book, but when, mm. I, when, I, when I found the connect, that was born out of a place of, have, you know, forcibly having to be very vulnerable and being right. in a space of intense, intense, intense grief. And 
you know, you fall into the, you know, why me? Like why, mm. you know, that's how you treat witches after all the offerings I've given you after all this shit, you know, this is what's going to be allowed to happen. And ultimately I had to get to this place where I realized that this was kind of my own making. If I truly wanted to be the type of person that I wanted to be, that that had this much compassion, this much empathy, I was going to have to suffer some really intense things to do that. And it goes back, you know, to me, you know, being like 12 years old and naked in my room with my little butter knife athame, you know, con trying to conjure spirit so, you know, I could be, you know, one of the best witches of all time, not fully realizing at 12 years old what that meant. Yeah. Looking back, holy crap, you know, there, 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 there's a continuum to it. it it's, it's as connected um it's as connected to me as you know my own visions my own dreams but it there will always I think be crisis um with creative anything because creativity and destruction go hand in hand they they have to pull out. and crisis for me is one of the main ways that the witch blood is given it's the main way the witch blood finds people whether it be through crisis epiphany or you know, initiation with a group. And which blood, said initiation with a group. Which blood happens through one of those ways. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, one of the most famous stories is there's a guy, he's out walking, he gets hit by a car, and now he's a psychic, like a, mm -hmm. like a psychic, and out healing people and doing crazy stuff. And, you know, that's just, you know, a narrative off the top of my head. But, like, we know that narrative. Um mm -hmm. Witches are no different. And these things happen on a very, you know, everything from micro to macro level, if you know where to look. And Absolutely. the witch blood has so many stories all throughout history and cultures yeah. of people literally being whisked away by the spirit of witchcraft. Like, mm -hmm. like witchcraft to, you know, historically speaking, witchcraft is something that you could catch, like a cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it was something to be feared, but it was also something that you could just give yourself to completely. Right. You know, there, 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 the ambiguity of that fascinated me. Mm -hmm. Uh but I could I only got there because I had to question, you know, am I doing anything? You know, are mm -hmm. my spells working at all? Am I just believing in something to believe in something for my own comfort and for my own security? Or is there actually something that's moving me through this and making me a better human being? Uh, the last thing that we want to admit to ourselves is grieving makes us a better human person, you know, better human being, because grief is horrible and it feels awful. Absolutely. But it's made me a much kinder, I think, person. It's made me much more empathetic to people's situation. Um, and I share an experience that I've I, I can now connect with that many more people over. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for going into that question. That was a, a dangerous question to ask sometimes um, because not everybody is so open about those things. Well, I appreciate I'll, be that. More, I'll be even more open and give you more context just okay. for clarity's sake. Um, but, you know, I mean, a huge reason of why I moved from Salem and came back to Michigan um, is it was like the end of December, I believe it was. Yeah, it was end of December. It was like two or three years ago. Uh, but I was hit by a car um, and that was like a very scary experience and it wasn't it wasn't very uh, like I wasn't hurt very severely but just you know the fact you know that damn like this could have happened that mortality yeah and that that was it and it really changed my outlook on everything and I went to a very dark place with it at first um, but that that that's a very Dionysian mystery in the sense that you know you go to that chthonic mm. realm only then to be skyrocketed to the soul's liberation of ecstasy. And in many ways, the book gave me that. Um, mm. the book was my voice after not having a voice about anything for so long. Uh and the book also was uh my way of saying, you know, there's more for me and there's more to me and being known for being a witch in Salem because Salem and my witchcraft have nothing to do with each other. You know, I was just a witch 
who happen to live in Salem, Massachusetts. I really, you know, I love, you know, the idea of being a Salem witch and people, you know, throwing around that as a, mm-hmm. as a marketing term, you know, but, but for me, I'm much more about, you know, I was a witch living in Salem. That's just what it was, you know, mm-hmm. um, it was. And so this was my continuation of who I was, what my witchcraft is after Salem. It's beautiful. I'm actually really, really glad that I asked that. And and thank you for giving that context. Because I think yeah. that, that with, with where readers are going to go with that and read into your work, I, I feel like that's going to give them a lot more of an oomph, right? I appreciate yeah. you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. It's a good question. Fortunately, we have to come to the end because I've kept you far longer than I was going to. So I, uh, but I appreciate you coming on, Nathan. This has been wonderful. Um, I'm curious. So, so how can people find out more about you? Website, social media. Where can people go? Absolutely. Um, so I do have a website. You can get me at witch-path-readings.square.site. I know there's a lot of dots in there, um, but. <laughs> Uh, you can also find me on my Instagram. I'm at Nathan underscore all one word toil in trouble for you fellow <laughs> Scottish play lovers. And uh, I'm also um, going to be on Facebook under Nathan King. Uh, and I also have a Nathan King author in which Facebook page as well. That's toggled onto there. Um, I'm pretty good about Instagram. I appreciate Instagram. I don't usually appreciate Facebook friend requests as much. So if you tend to go anywhere, uh, hit me up on Instagram. That That's how you're going to find me. Uh, and I also have an email if there are more direct questions or if people want to have more uh, sort of a direct, you know, direct uh, communication with me, uh, go for my email. My email is all on word witchpathreadings at gmail.com. I promise I read emails. So that's that's a really good way of, of if you've got something a little bit more urgent and more personal, send it in the email. Oh, perfect. So for those who are watching the video version on YouTube, um, I'll place the Instagram link just below Nathan's name down below, and then all of the other links into the show notes. And of course, people listening on on, um, on Spotify and Apple and all of those will be in the show notes. Um, thank you for coming on. I'm really excited to get more into your book and your book's coming out in July. So are they up for pre-orders yet? They are up for pre-orders. Um, okay. You can pre-order on Cross Crow directly. We're also on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and I think, uh, and and there's a couple others in there. But yeah, we're we're on there. Excellent, good stuff. Now I know that Cross Crow um, has a distribution deal with Wiser, so um, they should be able to get it in Australia, uh, the UK, Europe, and other places. It may be a little bit later though. So July is when it's coming out in 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 the United States. It may be later in the year for other parts, but that will all be on the Crossco website as well. And if not, I will get on to Blake and demand that he put it on there because it should be on there. Um, otherwise, um, I'll put all of the show notes, uh, all, all the links and show notes down below. Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. I've been Ben Stimson. This has been Nathan King. And thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us. Have a good rest of the day, folks. Bye, guys. <laughs>